welcome to Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacey Spanos, your host for this series of programs designed to explain the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. We're honored to be filming at the Holy Cross Chapel on the campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Massachusetts. In today's program, we'll discuss the House of God, iconography, our distinguished guests are Dr. Helen C. Evans. She holds the position of Mary and Michael Jeharis Curator for Byzantine Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Thanks for joining us. And we also have here today Dr. Anton C. Vrain. He is the Director of Religious Education for the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America and also author of the book, The Educating Icon. Thanks for being here, Dr. Vrain. Let me begin with you. What is an icon? An icon is any image of the holy that you use for veneration. We think of icons as wonderful images that are painted on wood, but the word icon is much more um, inclusive than that. It doesn't necessarily have to be wood. What other types of mediums? Um, any medium, a coin with an image of Christ to the Virgin, miniature mosaics, marble, wood, um, ivory. Many of the most beautiful ones from the Middle Ages are, frame, are ivory works. Um, Needlework, needlework, um, needlework, vestments for the priests that have images are an icon in motion. Um, there's nothing that couldn't be an icon if it has an image of the holy associated with it. And let me ask you, Dr. Vrain, in the Orthodox faith, who can be on an icon? It's obviously oh. not necessarily well, just Jesus. Well, no, it's, well, it starts with Jesus, Jesus Christ, of course, but his mother, the Virgin Mary, the saints, uh, John the Baptist, the great saints of the church, any saint of the church, but also then it gets into events. So you can have an icon of a particular event in the life of any of them, whether Christ, the Virgin, or a saint, or a, a moment in the history of the church. So uh, Helen finding the cross, uh, it beco becomes painted or depicted in an icon at some point. So the church has not limited itself just to portraiture. So it's got events and stories from antiquity, but there are even icons of things happening around us now, and there's contemporary. A very, and there's a very distinct style that we see in most Orthodox Christian churches, Dr. Evans, but you were telling me earlier, this is not necessarily how you'll see all icons. Um, there is no one style for icons. The ones here in this church are on the whole beautiful evocations of the middle Byzantine style. So the Virgin and Child and the apse are what you would see in churches around 1000, but there are Cretan icons in the Greek tradition, there are modern icons, there are Russian icons in a variety of styles, Bulgarian ones. To think that there is only one style is to not understand that these are a tradition that evolves. It's, it's not a stagnant tradition. Right. And then depending on when they were painted, whether it's from, as Helen said, from middle Byzantine period, the 10th, 11th century, earlier, more recent, we can see the style of even in the, a given school changing over time. If you look at the image of the Christ uh, blessing on the stand behind you, that's an image that goes with the earliest icon that, that survives the image of Christ at uh, the monastery of St. Catherine at Sinai in Egypt. The pose is exactly the same. The book is open. The, the images look totally different, and yet they are the same image in essence. So a bearded man with brown hair, blessing and holding the word open for you to follow to him. There are a lot of elements of the Orthodox faith that harken back to Judaism. Is, are icons one of those things? Did the early, did the Jews no. also have icons? No, no. I mean, we know this from- This is a purely Christian? Not quite. I wouldn't say either. purely Christian, but we know that one of the, this was one of the d debates about iconography uh, in the middle, uh, the late antique period of the church, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Uh, Judaism, we know we would think of as an aniconic tradition, no portraiture of its figures and its events. Uh, and that goes back to the Decalogue, the Mosaic Law. I am thy God and you will have no other gods before you. You will not make any images of God of any kind. And so Judaism doesn't develop that form of artistic representation. It does it in other ways. It decorates the temple and with all kinds of other elements, very decorative. We think of the Ark of the Covenant with cherubim on it, the Temple of Solomon with 
images of animals and plants of paradise and things like that, but no portraiture of figures. And so the Christians, and you can correct me on this one, begin to take that into a new direction fairly early on, though. It, I, where I would not disagree but say it's becoming more complex is that there's increasing attention being given by Jewish scholars to this site at Dura Europus in Syria that we know was destroyed in the third century. And the synagogue there on the Torah wall has the life of Moses in detail and portraits of the prophets. Whether that is an anomaly, as one once argued, are more broadly based and which Jewish communities, because Judaism, like Christianity, has many communities, is now a, a, a very interesting debate. Um, in an exhibition I just did, it was part of that debate. The result is we're not so certain whether these are as separate as we would have argued in the late 1800s. Um, but what certainly happens in the larger Christian world is that images are used to teach, and then in uh, the Orthodox world, they become increasingly part of the discussion of how to venerate the holy. And it's a huge debate because we have the iconoclastic controversy as part of it. It's not a simple everybody agrees. Yeah, ex yeah. Explain the controversy when it comes to icons. Well, in simple terms, <laughs> it's about 120 years of debate. It starts in the early 700s, 725, some people give it the debate, that the Byzantine emperor, the church at that time begins to say, this is idolatrous. The behavior that people have towards icons, the veneration, the incense, all these things. Yeah, that we're it, worshiping idols. That we're worshiping idols. And as a kind of a religious reform movement, as I would think about it, it's decided that we won't do this and we'll ban them. And to keep the story simple, a number of church conferences are held to decide this, and ultimately the church bans any type of iconography, any type of artwork. And we get this practice called iconoclasm, icons being destroyed, you know, the, the, the breaking of icons. And it initially there's resolved at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, 787, and the church comes around and says, no, this is part of the authentic Christian tradition to have iconography, but also to use them as aids in our worship and our prayer because we're not worshiping to the icon itself no. or to the no. image of the icon. What's no. going on? And in that, the was, that was actually part of the debate. And the, ins the insight, I think, that was so genius for its time was that the, the act of veneration, the kissing of the icon, the bowing in front of it, the procession, is being directed not at the image, not the wood, not the paint, as John of Damascus would have said back then, but to what it's being depicted. So the idea that the, uh, and an idea from the, how they venerated the emperor at the time, the honor given to the image passes through to the prototype, the con who it is really. To put that in our terms, um, if your grandparents look at a picture of the grandchildren uh, and they hug it and they even kiss it, uh, who, what's being kissed? Is it the grandchild or is it just the glass and the paper that the, icon, that the picture is printed on? And the same exact argument was being made at the time of the Seventh Council. But the debate continued for about another 40, 50 years, and it really doesn't resolve itself until 815. And it's finally once and for all, icons become part of the tradition, no, no more challenges uh, at a grand scale. And Dr. Evans, I have also heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the icons were widely used in the early church, especially as a means to educate people at a time when people were mostly illiterate. Well, there, there are certainly early writers that talk about using the images as educational tools, and I'm sure that that is true. That's in all Christian communities. Again, it's the transformation of them into a means for spiritual veneration, a way to reach the holy by contemplating an image that is what makes it really to me an icon in the Orthodox world, um, as opposed to a picture in a Roman Catholic church. Um, and then the Protestant faiths tend to reject saints in general. Explain to us what we're seeing here of this, this bank of icons in front of the altar. 
Well, it's a wonderful um, iconostasis, but why I find it particularly wonderful is it is an effort to revive one of the earliest stages of the screen between the congregation and the most sacred part of the church, the apse with the altar. So you have what are evocations of what would have originally been marble panels and the tall columns and the architrave across the top. And in the beginning, there may have been nothing where the images are now, and then there may have been curtains, and then they began to put icons in there. And by the later centuries, you have the, the great screen of images, but here what you have is the consistent ones. Christ, the Virgin, John, John the, the forerunner, John the precursor, the Baptist, and then the saint or the, in this case, narrative that goes with the specific building. This is the Church of the Holy Cross, and it's the finding of the Holy Cross with Constantine and Helena right. uh, behind me. So, Was over every there. church laid out like this, every Orthodox yep. church? Basically. Those yep. are the rules. Basically. Explain to me. Well, first to the right. Well, you, as for you start with Christ in the, this position, then always next to him is John the Baptist, John the forerunner. What happens after that may will depend on the width of the space and what needs there are to fill that space. The doors then, because there's a door at the end of the, in this instance, will frequently have an angel, Gabriel or Michael, depending on which door it is or a deacon, because these doors are often called deacon doors. So the deacon who's a, the, a saint, Saint Stephen, the first martyr, other deacons may be depicted there. And then on the, to, the, to our left, you have the Virgin Mary and then the name of the church. So it's very standard across all Orthodox churches will use this basic layout. Some churches then will go higher, add rows, and that was an even later development um, and so you'll see saints, events in the life of Christ, prophets, depending on how high up they go. Especially in the Russian tradition, uh, they might go all the way to the, to the ceiling. And let me ask you about this part above uh, these doors here. Uh, in my particular yeah. church down in Florida, there is, is an eye. And yeah. here is uh, the Last, the last, the last supper. supper. Thank you. Anything goes at that point? It's up to the church or well, who makes the, that decision? The tradition has been more dominant to use the Last Supper, okay. I would say, I, to my knowledge. Uh, it's because this is the table, the, it's the entry to the table and the table that the Eucharist is going to be celebrated on, the table at which we're gathered around with Christ to share in the Last Supper. And so the icon over the door saying, this is reminding us of this is why we're gathered, mm -hmm. to share in this meal. This is not the most ornate church I've been in, but it's certainly very beautiful because it's got significance because it's here at the seminary. Are other churches more modest? Um, and is that okay? It's certainly okay. And there are churches of all types that, um, from those who can afford the most elaborate as when Justinian built Hagia Sophia and to those who have much less money who would be among the first um, Greeks coming to America in the first generations you bring into the church what's the core of your faith, the need to separate the congregation from the clergy by a barrier, and that that barrier should carry images that speak of what is important about the faith, and the quality of the painter determines how great the icons are. Um, Let me ask you, are all Orthodox churches, when they have icons up, are they all in the Byzantine tradition? No. No. And that points, to me at least, that points to both when they were built, the aesthetic concerns, the artistic concerns at that given moment. Because that's what I think people associate it with, that Byzantine associate. look. But you see churches, especially I would say from the you know, 16th, 17th, 19th century for sure, early 20th century, where the art began, begins to take on new forms, it changes. We would say it becomes more Western because of the influence of are the movements in art around the world, especially the you know, Renaissance, et cetera. So this traditional, very Byzantine style uh, had developed over time. But it was, I would say, the late, mid-20th century, rather, uh, to, to this day, this became a revival, saying, wait, we need to kind of get back to our sources. And, th and from the historic examples of from a much earlier time. And so this, this, this Byzantine style 
was, was essentially revived and has become more, much more dominant today than it would have been 70 or 80 years ago, even in the, Greece. And Byzantine is an empire that lasts a thousand years. Its art evolved throughout that period. So even when you're saying a Byzantine style, if you're talking about the icons of Crete, they're a much more animated tradition than the revival that is in this building, which is deliberately evoking, give or take, a century or two, the year 1000. So what other styles are there of icons? Because, of course, I grew up in the church, so this is what I've come to identify it with. But Well, we both might have different terms, but they're the first icons which survive primarily at the Monastery of St. Catherine right. at Sinai. They're the icons that evolve in what we call the Middle Byzantine period, which is a period of great power for the imperial center at Constantinople. I keep looking at this iconostasis and realizing that the virgin and the narrow columns beside her look very much like an ivory icon of that period that we own at the Metropolitan Museum. The, then you have the latter years, the late Byzantine period, the post-Byzantine period, when there is an interest in much more detail. The, a scene will tend to have secondary stories behind it, and they are much more animated. And then in the post-Byzantine centuries, by the late 19th century, you have a, um, icon painters who are reflecting the European tradition of a more volumetric figures. And each of those in its own period is very much the style. And if, perhaps if you were in a Russian church, you would be doing a revival of Stroganov icons or Novgorod icons. There are more variations than we think because the themes are more limited. We do images of the Virgin in certain poses because they carry great sanctity. The image of the Virgin and Child behind me is the Virgin Hodegitria, not in the iconostasis, but on the um, stand. That's the Virgin, pointing toward the child, showing the way to salvation. Oh, the, the picture, the picture uh, the, I'm on sorry, the, stand. the icon in the stand behind you um, there. It comes from a monastery in Constantinople. If you had traveled to Constantinople, you would want a copy of the Virgin Hodegitria because you have seen it there. It was a miracle working icon. And eventually it becomes um, the belief that the evangelist Luke, when he paints an image of the virgin and child when, when they are alive, that that's the image he paints. But that's a much later tradition and yet one with a great um, appeal and I, de I desire to know what these people really look like. Might that have been the first icon? It's well, unlikely that Luke actually <laughs> painted it. Um, actually, what's frequently called the first icon is the one that's at the top of the apse here, this veil, this cloth. There's a legend from antiquity that points, that says that uh, a king, King Abgar in Edessa, was ill and heard about this teacher, Jesus, and, and he's a healer and wants to be healed by him. And so he sends a servant to bring Jesus or bring something of Jesus to be healed. And Jesus presses his face into a cloth, and I'm shortening the story a bit, presses his face into a cloth and his image of Christ is transferred to the cloth, and then he takes it back, the king is healed, and this cloth is hung in the city for centuries. And from the so, city it's carried the to icon. Constantinople <laughs> right. in the reign of Constantine the Seventh, and then it is in some way lost in the Fourth Crusade, and when I went to borrow the earliest one that survives, it's probably a icon from the Balkans, perhaps Serbian, that is in Lyon in France that we can track right. the Catholic bishop that takes yeah. it. And it is presumably an icon not made by human hands. Right. We have absolutely no idea what the image that was actually carried to Constantinople right. looks like. Right. This is, so this is the tradition of what we think it looks like. This looks very much like the one in France, but whether that is the original yeah. one, it, it doesn't, ex it's not around anymore, so And we allow don't. me to ask this question, how do we know, and are, are these accurate depictions of what the Theotokos looks like? Is this what Jesus looked like? It's what we want them to have looked like. Right. We have no. We have we no documentation. There are, no, there, there are no descriptions of either of them. 
the Gospels don't say the tall brown-haired man with a right. beard um, went out and right. raised the dead. Um, we have found these to be, in a way, comforting to yeah. all Christians. It's a, and yet, when you look over the centuries, you realize the face of Christ, the hair, the eyes, they change. You, you go to Ravenna, Italy, and Christ is a young man, clean-shaven, looking like a, a Roman nobleman of, his time, of the time. Uh, and then by the time you get to the, you know, much later, he, 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 he acquires a beard, the dark hair, things like that. In other cultures, all of a sudden, he becomes more red-haired, fuller face, different color eyes. And Dr. Evans, you told me something. The depiction of Christ may reflect the culture of the time, but it's the essence of Christ I, that's the most important. It's very much, I think, the essence. The fourth century sarcophagi, which are some of the earliest images that we have in the, the Christian world, he's usually completely curly-haired and looks like he's 12 years old. Um, and <laughs> even yeah. when he's being crucified at 30, he looks like he's 12. Um, we, in the first centuries of the Christian world, certainly knew him in a, as a very historical figure. We knew where he was born and where he lived by our time, which is 2,000 plus years after his life. And for, for several centuries before that, he was much more an essence that we wanted to asso associate with our own cultures. And that's when you begin to get Scandinavian blonde Christ right. and Ethiopian Christ. It's when his historical reality isn't yeah. as important to you as the essence of his meaning. Um, in these, you have kind of a hybrid. We don't know what he looks like, but he certainly right. could have been in, in the Holy Land looking like this, and he would have looked like an inhabitant. Yeah. But then when you get into the, the icons of saints, I think that's what it, you see something different taking place. Then all of a sudden, characteristics that the saint must have had in life are now showing up in the icons. Um, you know, John Chrysostom usually has a very short beard, as I have. St. Basil the Great always has a very long, pointy beard. And do we have historical documentation? That's how they look? Of course they're, not. They're, I don't believe so. Uh, but the fact that their, Im their icons were being painted fairly quickly after their deaths says to me that the, the painters, the community wants to remember them, and they pick up the, those characteristics that were unique to that individual. And then the tradition, because it's artistically fairly, sta fairly stable, retains that. And then somebody writes that on a book. If you want to paint an icon of this saint, he has a long brown beard, he has curly hair, he holds this, he's dressed like that, so that the, there's a normative tradition of how to depict saint so-and-so. Sure. Let me ask you, Tony, uh, we've heard about icons that cry. How does the Orthodox Church view those? We leave it up and say it's one of these mysteries. We don't understand how it happens, why it happens. Uh, we can find explanations all on both sides of the equation of why an icon is crying. Um, it's a long tradition of that, in, you know, miracle working icons. And but when you get into the crying icon, some will say, well, it's because the saint or the virgin is a frequent crier. Sorry to sound disrespectful in icons. She's upset about the world, and then the same person says, no, she's happy about something else. And so again, I think we begin to ascribe some of our sensitivities about what we see going on around us, and then this event that seems to have no explanation, you know, and people get investigating and look behind them to see and look for the little trick that somebody may have played, and uh, you know, those kinds of things. And then we put, we put our meanings and our concerns to the image. And that's, I think, part of the beauty of the icon. We bring ourselves to this image. We want this relationship with God, and we find it in the icon because we're, we're visual people. You know, it's hard to abstract my relationship to the Virgin Mary or Christ, but when I can look at his image, I can form a relation, I can help in that relationship to Christ or the Virgin. Dr. Evans, is there a standard for creating an icon, or is it basically up to the skill level of the artist? I, there's not a standard, but there are, as, as Tony was talking about, there were books that began to be written that said, Saint, it, it goes back as far as St. Peter, but St. Peter has short curly hair, 
St. Paul has a high forehead, which is a symbol of being a learned scholar, and so that if you're going to do these images, you should be working within that tradition. Beyond that, it is the skill of the painter. Um, so can I create an icon? Yes, or you can anybody create an icon? can create an icon. It's an image that you then use as a way to approaching the holy. Um, so it, in a way to me, an icon is more of what you do with it than yeah. whether you hire Michelangelo to paint it right. or me. Um, except yeah. you would get much better art with Michelangelo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people ask me if there are bad icons. I said only the ones I could paint because I can't draw a straight line. Um, so. <laughs> well, let me ask you. I mean, if there, we've all seen controversial forms of art over the years. Is, is there a point at which an icon or an artist can create something that could be considered sacrilegious? Sure, sure. Uh, very, I would say, controversial or really very jolting. Um, are some iconographers, contemporary iconographers, who I can think of one in the head, in my in my mind, who kind of strips the image down to its barest of essentials, and uh, you would have the figure in color, but if he's holding a book, it would be etched in, and you wouldn't see it until you get very very close. And some, but when you look at the execution of the face, you say, "My gosh, this is very traditional." Mm -hmm. But yet when you pull the image back or the color palettes, four colors, you go, this is strikingly different. And you're like, wow. Um, and I might say, wow, do I want that in my church? Do I want to pray in front of that? Maybe, maybe not. People are going to react to it differently, just as we react to all for art forms. Right. Dr. Evans? There are contemporary artists who, in fact, have given up the image and use luminescence. So kind of the essence of the image, which isn't to a degree what the Hesychast movement thought that you or thinks that you can see when you contemplate in the right way that you see the light around Christ at Mount Tabor. Um, those artists would say that by looking at and contemplating these images, which are only light, you are drawn to trying to draw the figure, draw the essence yourself. Um, I would imagine that most congregations coming into a church with an iconostasis that perhaps had a red panel and a blue panel and a yellow panel would not know what they were looking at. Right. But it might be incredibly meaningful to others. It, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. what yeah. you know and what you bring to it. The, the, the yeah. works are done with great dedication. Some people use the phrase, write an icon, not paint an icon. Oh, that one makes my teeth grate all the time. Um, <laughs> but I think if you look at cr the Christ child up in the apps, that's as close to writing an icon as I think you can get. Yes. But I also yeah. have trouble well, with it, that term. It, it's, it's also, the, the part, we, of it's a a part of it's a linguistic problem. Uh, the word to make an icon, iconographos, means to write to an write icon, an literally. Icon. Yes, literally, but correct. But in Greek, you be, in Greek, you, that means write anything, any kind of text, but it's also the same word, word to paint. So zoographos in modern Greek means just to do a portrait. So it's the, so it would literally, that which literally means life writing. So, so people have heard that and said, well, therefore I am writing an icon, not painting an icon. But if you ask the iconographers, they says, no, I'm painting. I'm using paints and colors and things like that. What I think the idea is getting at is kind of interesting is in the icons frequently says by the hand of, it's, it's uh, inscribed as if there was an author, not a painter. Or the idea that when we begin to in look at the icon, we can read it because we can see the story, we can see details in the life of the saint or the event that we can now read. And so this idea that the icon, like much of art, becomes, as the anthropologists would say, a text that we now can study, we can reflect on, we can learn from, and contemplate. And as we see in this church, icons do not, well, we've talked about it, do not have to be painted. They can also be tile mosaics. They can be anything. Um, we have in this church painted icons. Um, we have over in the um, reliquary container ones that are, are in many other media. It is a relatively late development in the Orthodox world when icons come to mean painted panels. And in fact, 
it's only relatively late that panel paintings become the dominant form of icon. If you're looking at the period that this installation refers to, truly ivories are more popular than panel paintings on wood. Panel paintings on wood originally are a lot cheaper than mosaics. So the image of the Virgin in the apse here is a mosaic and that was the most luxurious the most expensive form of image, and many of the works that we think of as the, the greatest icons, again around the year 1000, are in fact mosaics, which are then copied, and in varying ways, on panel paintings that remain alive today. Right. So it moves, and then frescoes are cheaper than mosaics, and panel paintings on wood right. are cheaper than yeah. painting on a finished fresco. Um, yeah. it, you always have to add, <laughs> how much money did you have to spend? So, uh, of course. <laughs> right, and well, it's critical. Um, let me ask you, Tony, are, can we be considered icons? Sure. If each one of us is created in the image and likeness of God, the word image is ikona. And so you, there's something in each one of us that contains the holy within us and can radiate that in our relationships to other people, the world around us. We ask that of camp, kids at camp all the time and, you know, find the icon find the icon. And the best answer, and this is for all the kids out there, grab the kid next to you and lift him up because you're, the person sitting next to you is, is an icon created in the image and likeness of God. <laughs> um, Dr. Evans, let me ask you about the significance of something that the Orthodox uh, faith holds dear. It's called uh, Sunday of Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that tradition. Well, the Sunday of Orthodoxy is the Sunday that celebrates the second um, Council of Nicaea, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, when icons are again authorized to the church. And so that is very important. It is the reason that you have an iconostasis in this church. It is a, a central moment in the history of the Orthodox faith. And ultimately it comes to have its own icon where you have those who were martyred for their defense of icons grouped around originally an image of the Virgin and Child, and then eventually sometimes you get many more icons. It's a very, very definitive moment when you look at the history of what defines the Orthodox Church. And it's celebrated the first Sunday of Lent in, the, in all Orthodox churches because it commemorates when the iconoclastic controversy finally ends in 843. It's proclaimed on the first Sunday of Lent that year and so it becomes known as the Sunday of Orthodoxy, the triumph of Orthodoxy, being the ultimate restoration of icons and the iconic tradition within the church. Well, Dr. Evans and Dr. Brain, thank you very much. Thank you. And to see more programs in this series, Discovering Orthodox Christianity, please visit youtube.com slash Greek Orthodox Church. I'm Stacey Spanos. Thanks for joining us.